So I am super excited to kick off advanced symposium number one for the California Bicycle Summit. Our speakers today are inspiring. The content is amazing. And you all who are here, uh, hundreds of you, uh, uh, are the core of our movement and will benefit uh, hugely from this session. I want to thank everyone for their contributions to the movement, especially the thousands of you who supported our bills to repeal jaywalking and to repeal the unnecessary, stupid law that requires us to come to a complete stop at empty intersections if there's a stop sign. As you know, the governor vetoed those bills. However, the reason why we introduced those bills in the first place was in order to strengthen the movement and broaden the movement to help more California cities become more equitable and more prosperous where more people can experience the joy of bicycling. And we succeeded in that. Thousands of people signed our petition. Uh, uh, more than a hundred organizations came on in support of both of those bills. And uh, we are prepared next year to introduce and win some measures that will do a lot more than frankly, those would have done. Disappointing not to get them, but uh, they were also symbolic in a way. Next year, we are going uh, away from the symbolic and to the uh, material, practical victories that will help our cities. We're going to work to make hundreds of millions of dollars available to cities to build protected bikeways and, and other things necessary to have a safe bikeway network. Uh, we're going to make shared bikes and scooters accessible and affordable to everyone in California. We're going to change the design rules so that we're going to get rid of uh, door zone bike lanes and make it easier for cities to narrow traffic lanes. And we're going to save lives by requiring uh, trucks to have side guards so that uh, people won't get run over. That's just the beginning of what we're going to do. We have some work to do to finalize that agenda, and you'll be hearing all about that. I'm really looking forward to uh, an exciting uh, agenda next year. Um, this is the, uh, the seminar today is a, uh, a fantastic primer on all of the things that cities around the world are doing to make our cities more prosperous and more equitable through the joy of bicycling. It is the first of, uh, three symposium, uh, symposia that we have. I will, uh, share my screen to bring up the next two. So today is uh, Cycling for Sustainable Cities. In December, we have a presentation about Latin, lessons from Latin America. I think sometimes some of us uh, too often look to Northern Europe as the, the place for lessons, but our neighbors to the South are doing some amazing things. And we're gonna hear all about it on December 7th. The speakers uh, will be uh, Lorena Romero, you might remember her from the 2019 summit in Los Angeles. She's the director of BC Activa based in, Los, uh, based in Columbia, Bogota. Uh, and she'll also be with us in April, by the way. She'll be joined by two of the authors of the book. One is Daniel Rodriguez. He's a professor of the Department of City and Regional Planning from the University of California, Berkeley, and Carlos Felipe Pardo, also from Bogota. He's a director of Despacio. Despacio is uh, an or a mobility justice organization uh, based in Bogota. These, and then uh, we're gonna uh, hear from folks in California, uh, some of our local partners in the East Bay, in Los Angeles, and San Jose will share with us uh, some of their lessons. Th that session will have some breakout sessions. 
all of this is a precursor to the thing that I am so looking forward to seeing you all in person in April. I can't wait. The California Bicycle Summit is coming to Oakland in April, April 6th through the 9th in beautiful uptown Oakland, California in an event center called Oak Stop. Uh, Oakland uh, is the home of the scraper bikes, among many other things that Oakland has to share. That's one of the most exciting. The Oak Stop, the event center, is just steps from the 19th Street BART station, so it's super accessible. That's where our breakouts are gonna be. Our plenary sessions are gonna be a block away in a place called the California Ballroom, this beautiful 1912 building that's just perfect for this kind of event. We'll be going back and forth between that and this place, the owner of Oak Stop, which is a uh, black owned local event center, uh, is very much interested in making the neighborhood uh, that his center is in a uh, pedestrian and bicycle friendly place. So we're excited to be supporting uh, you know, that is somebody who realizes that their success comes from uh, the success of uh, the neighborhood around it. The center has some beautiful breakout spaces that are used as galleries when they're not used for meetings. The acoustics are great. The lighting is great. I am really looking forward to it. One of the uh, things that it doesn't have that a typical convention center has is a lobby where you hang out. And so we're gonna close the street. Out in front, we'll be able to enjoy uh, the, the public space as a uh, place to gather and meet. Uh, the theme last year was intersections. Uh, this year, we are working on the theme, but no matter what theme we have, there's gonna be a dance party as there always is. This year, that dance party has a twist. That dance party is gonna be on wheel. The, the event coincides with the East Bay Bike Party, which is a monthly celebration of bicycling that rolls through various East Bay cities. It's gonna roll through Oakland in April. And we're gonna to get to take part. The East Bay Bike Party is a three segment bike ride, casual, and the uh, segments are separated by, you guessed it, dance parties. That's gonna be a blast. I can't wait uh, for the California Bicycle Summit uh, to come in person to Oakland. And I want you all to register for it. Some of you already have. These symposia are free. The event is uh, $425, but you can get it uh, for $295, I think. Right now as an early bird, so I think you should register right away. And we have a surprise today. If you register today by midnight tonight, you will get a free copy of Cycling for Sustainable Cities. Ah, how can I make that show up? <laughs> uh, anyway, it's a, a book, there it is. Cycling for Sustainable Cities. This book that we are talking about today, we'll, you'll get a free copy if you register for the summit at the early bird price by midnight tonight. So with that, uh, I am very, very much looking forward to uh, introducing our speakers. Um, we have John, Professor John Puker, and I'm making my notes so I get this right. Um, John Puker is the Professor Emeritus in the School of Planning and Public Policy at Rutgers University in New Jersey. I had the pleasure of hearing him in 2007 at the National Bike Summit. He was the keynote speaker and it was about it was some professor, about some book. And I was thinking, oh, this is gonna be, uh, this is gonna be a little dry. I've never heard a more entertaining uh, presentation in my life, it was fantastic. He will be joined by Ralph Bueller, who's a uh, professor and chair of urban affairs and planning at Virginia Tech's Research Center in Arlington, Virginia. The two of them have collaborated on the second edition 
of Cycling for Sustainable Cities published by MIT Press. It is an encyclopedia of what cities are doing to make their uh, cities prosperous and healthy and equitable through the joy of bicycling. I am very excited to turn it over now to Professor John Cooker. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks, Dave, uh, for the kind words in your introduction. Uh, over the past two decades, I've known Dave. He's become a living legend, truly a living legend in the world of cycling advocacy. Dave is also one of the co-authors of the chapter on cycling advocacy in the book we'll be discussing today. Ralph and I thank both Dave and the California Bike Coalition for hosting today's presentation on cycling for sustainable cities. We also thank CalBike and all of its affiliated local advocacy organizations for everything they do to promote safe and convenient cycling throughout California. I'd like to emphasize the progress that has been made improving cycling conditions in California would never have been possible without the crucial support of state and local cycling advocates. Finally, we'd like to thank each of you in the audience for taking the time to participate in this webinar. I'd like to send from Raleigh, North Carolina, all the way over to California, a huge big hello to uh, my long time colleagues and friends, professionals and academics and everyone else I know there in California. It's just, uh, it's just wonderful to give this talk to such a great audience there in California. Uh, now, just a few words about me, John Pucher. Uh, almost all of my research over the past four decades has involved international comparisons of urban transportation. That helps explain the international scope of our new book. I think we can learn a lot from other countries about how to improve cycling conditions, to make cycling safer, and to raise cycling levels among all segments of the population. Now over to Ralph. Hello from me as well. My name is Ralph Duhler. I'm professor and chair in urban affairs and planning at, at Virginia Tech. Uh, I study mainly the determinants of how people get around, if they walk, if they ride a bike, if they ride public transport, if they drive, and how these decisions then relate to the, the environment, the economy, and uh, to equity. Like John, most of my work is international comparative, uh, looking for lessons uh, that cities and countries can learn fr from each other to make their transport systems more sustainable. International comparisons already gets me to the, the book and the, the talk we give today. Uh, Cycling for Sustainable Cities, the book, is a collaboration of uh, over 40 experts on bicycling from five continents, so truly international in the areas of planning, engineering, geography, and public health. And the main theme of the book is how to make city cycling safe and convenient for everyone. You can already see in the title slide here, it's we're talking about cycling for men as well as for women, cycling for people of all ages, cycling for people of all races and ethnicities. And you can already see some of the measures that are implemented uh, in, in various cities around the world to make cycling safe and convenient for everyone. Um, this also carries through to the cover of the book. This is a picture from Amsterdam in the Netherlands. This is everyday cycling there. This is not a big cycling event. This is everyday cycling. And, we can see A, there are lots of cyclists. You can also see that they are riding um, ordinary bikes. They're wearing ordinary clothes. Um, some bikes have uh, are cargo bikes. or have special baskets to carry to carry some uh, some cargo. And you can also see that we have a green a green light there uh, for for bicycling. And this is what true mass bicycling looks like. The following slides. I'm going to briefly talk about the different chapters we have in the book. And then we sort of start the presentation, but we cannot cover everything that's in the book. That's why I wanna give you a short outline of the different, different chapters. The book starts with an introduction and international overview written by John and myself. Um, it's then followed by chapters on specific important topics on cycling, starting out with cycling and health written by public health experts from Australia, cycling and safety, very important. And then of course that's related to bicycling and infrastructure uh, for everyone in, in chapter five. Chapter six focuses on bike parking, very important. Bicycles are parked more than they, than they are ridden. 
Chapter seven focuses on non-infrastructure programs and policies to promote cycling, that's also very important. In chapter eight, we have an evaluation of um, cycling policies and how we can evaluate which policy to implement and which policy to implement first. Chapters nine and 10 look at technology and bicycling. One is about um, uh, e-bikes and their spread in Europe and North America. And the other one is on bike sharing and the ongoing evolution and expansion. The next chapter is focused on different groups of the, the population, different groups of cyclists, starting with a chapter on women and cycling, followed by a chapter on children and bicycling. And then there's a chapter on older adults and, uh, and biking. These chapters are sort of bookended uh, by a chapter looking at social justice and cycling for everyone. After that, we have country and city case studies of bicycling, starting with the two most populous countries in the world, China and India, and an overview of cycling there, followed by an overview of cycling in Latin America. And then next we have case studies of cycling in cities, starting with mega cities, New York, London, and Paris compared, followed by two European large cycling legacy cities, Copenhagen and Amsterdam. Uh, and then that, after that, we have a, a chapter comparing uh, Portland, Oregon and Seville, Spain, two newcomers uh, to bicycling, at least relative newcomers and how they implemented their pro bike policies. Chapter 20 is very important for the audience here because uh, Dave Snyder, uh, Cal Bikes director is a co-author on that. You can spot him there in the list. It's about cycling advocacy in Europe, North America and Australia. And then in the end, John and I summarize everything and give an outlook uh, on the future of, of bicycling. There are two good reasons why the word sustainable is in the title of our book. Uh, number one, cycling is very sustainable. Uh, probably the most sustainable of urban transport modes. The only thing that even comes close is walking. Um, and the advantage of cycling is you can uh, cover lo longer distances than you can by bicycling. At any rate, the, uh, the other reason that's, that's sustainable, that word is the title, is that every single chapter, literally every single one of the 21 chapters, deals with uh, various for various dimensions of sustainability. Uh, so it really is a, an overriding theme throughout the book. The other overriding theme, by the way, is equity and social justice. But in terms of going after sustainability, uh, there's sort of, you could categorize these dimensions in maybe three categories. Um, it's environmentally friendly. I think that's sort of a, a no-brainer. I think everyone uh, pretty much realizes that. There's virtually no pollution uh, in cycling. Uh, there's very little in the way of non-renewable resources used. So it's, it's a pretty obvious that cycling is environmentally friendly. Um, it's economical. So there, there is a dimension of sustainability. It's uh, economical sustainability. And uh, clearly there's very low private costs. Uh, I mean, you can buy a 5000 or $10,000 bike, but it certainly doesn't have to be that. Uh, low private costs, both of uh, buying and, and using the bike, but also low public costs. Costs much, much, much less to, to build a protected bike lane or bike path uh, than it does to widen a roadway. And it actually costs a lot less than public transit as well. I'm not, nothing against public transit, but uh, uh, cycling really uh, providing infrastructure that's necessary for safe and convenient and low stress cycling uh, is still much, much cheaper than, than almost any other kind of transportation investment. Uh, it also reduces costs as various studies have shown. So there's actually quite a bit of economic advantage here, savings uh, for, uh, on the in terms of uh, health costs uh, because cycling is just such, such a healthy way to get around, which is the third point. <laughs> Uh, the health benefits of cycling are part of what's known as sustain social sustainability. So um, you have, an, and it's not just physical health benefits. That's probably what most of you think, which are wrong. <laughs> uh, physical health benefits are really important, but as is documented in great detail by four public health professors in chapter three, uh, three of the book, um, there are a wide range of very important mental health benefits and social health benefits. Um, so the health, and the other thing is that the health benefits that have been measured by now by hundreds of studies over the past two decades, far, far outset, uh, offset any of the, uh, the risks uh, in terms of the traffic safety uh, of cycling. The other thing that's important here is the equity aspect. The uh, cycling is indeed financially affordable by almost everyone. Uh, and it's physically possible for most people. 
not for everyone. There are certain people with certain kinds of disabilities or other problems that uh, make cycling not possible, but, but for most people, it's physically possible. So in this sense, I mean, it, the cycling, I would say, is just about the perfect mode of transportation. Uh, in every dimension of sustainability, it beats just about every other means. Next, yes. Uh, in spite of that, <laughs> unfortunately, I don't think that message has quite gotten through to English-speaking countries. Uh, maybe sustainability, just uh, uh, we need another language than English to express this. But if you look at this, uh, the countries with the lowest of major countries, countries with the lowest levels of cycling or English-speaking countries, shame on us, uh, but about one to two percent um, in um, uh, in these countries, the United States, Australia, Canada, the UK, and so forth. Whereas over to the right-hand part of that chart, you know, it goes all the way up to 28%. It's almost a third of all trips by bike in the Netherlands, 14% uh, in Denmark, 13% in Japan, which by the way, it's 17% in greater Tokyo, 11% in, in Germany and so forth. I don't have to read the whole thing, but obviously much, much higher shares of bicycling uh, over in Europe um, and also in Japan than we have in these English speaking countries. Well, that I guess that considers UK not part of Europe. Well, I'm not sure if they think consider themselves part of Europe. Well, uh, some of you might think, well, is this due to much longer trip distances uh, in uh, the United States uh, or Canada or, or Australia? Uh, and actually it's partly due to that, but not most. Uh, it is true that uh, we'd have more sprawl, more car oriented metropolitan areas here in the United States. But did you know, now you will know, uh, that 40% of all trips in our sprawled American metropolitan areas are two miles or shorter. 40% two miles or shorter, and that's an easy distance to cover by bike. Believe me, it's an easy distance. Uh, so there's really no, the distance is really not a good excuse for us not cycling. What this particular graphic does, however, it controls for trip distance. That is, it looks within each trip distance category. What is the percentage of all trips within that distance category made by bike? And what you see here is that in Germany, Denmark, and the Netherlands, much, I mean, dramatically higher percentage of trips are made by bike, regardless of which distance category it is. That, to me, is really stunning. Well, uh, the, that's sort of the bad news that is in the United States, Canada, and so forth. We have sort of relatively low levels of cycling. The good news is we have made progress. And I think you have to look on the positive side because uh, it takes, we, we just can't start um, with a full bicycle network and high levels of cycling. We have to start from our existing low levels from especially about 1990 or so. Uh, but what you see here is in these countries that are bracketed here that had low levels, beginning levels of cycling, you see two to tenfold increases uh, in levels of cycling. That is progress. It's still, they're still lower. Those blue, the blue bars there are still lower than the ones off to the right, but the huge progress. Uh, the other issue, look at, look at San Francisco. Uh, which I think has one of the uh, major cities, one of the highest boat shares of cycling uh, in California, uh, more than a tripling in the percentage of trips by bike. You had 1% in 1990, up to 3.3% in 2017. Um, going over, uh, by the way, oh, by the way, staying on this select number, you see the really huge, huge increases, tenfold or more uh, in Seville, Seville, Spain, and in uh, Bogota, Colombia, big increases in Vienna, Portland, and so forth. Now, head over to the right-hand side of that chart, and you'll see even these sort of, as Ralph calls them for some legacy cycling cities, cities with a tradition, a culture of cycling, even they managed to greatly increase cycling. We could have a doubling in Berlin. And look at the Netherlands, look at Amsterdam. I mean, you already had over 20% of all trips by bike, but wow, look at this. You now have like over 35%. I mean, that's, I'm not sure exactly the point of that, 40% increase, a big increase in, the, in Amsterdam as well, an increased level of cycling, uh, so that there has been progress even in these cities that already have a high level of cycling. I'd like to call your attention to Frankfurt. Uh, even though it's over grouped there with on the right hand side with those European cities, um, it started out, it would, if you ask any German, they would say, Frankfurt? A bicycling city? No way! Well, it didn't used to be a bicycling city. 
uh, back in, let me see, what was it, 1998, so not that long ago, about not roughly 2000, only about, the, what, five or six percent of trips uh, were by bike in Frankfurt, and no German would come bicycle-friendly city. Well, that city, over the past 20 years, has implemented an incredible range of, of self-reinforcing measures, so now uh, it's 20 percent, and in the people of Frankfurt uh, passed a referendum requiring politicians and policymakers, the local government, to continue to make Frankfurt into the bicycling city of Germany. How do you like that? Uh, the whole population supports making it into a cycling city. Okay, I just wanted to make that point. Next, Ralph. And during COVID, we got a little bit of an, of an impression of what the potential of bicycling is. This graph here shows you eco counter data based on counters that count bicycles as they as they go by aggregated to the level of, of various countries comparing the number of bikes counted in 2020 to 2019 whenever these colorful lines here are above the zero it means during that week of the year and the weeks are on the horizontal axis here during that week of the year there was more cycling in 2020 than in 2019 and we see that these lines for most countries are now mainly above the zero lines there was more cycling during COVID in 2020 than in 2019. We also see this big dip here around week 14 through week 18 or so. This is mainly for European countries that had severe lockdowns uh, during COVID where you were not allowed to, to leave your home, where you could only leave your home with a piece of paper saying where you're going or you were restricted to a certain area uh, around your house. So during those lockdowns, bicycling dropped, but as they were lifted, cycling skyrocketed and, and increased there as well. Looking in more detail at this COVID and cycling data, uh, we, we saw overall increases in cycling volumes. Um, we also saw, as you could see with the many lines on the, the, the slide before, a lot of variation by months, by time of day, by location, and by trip purpose. In general, bicycling increased for exercise, recreation, getting outdoors, and relief from stress, as many people also state in surveys that were taken. Relief of stress was an important element why people went out to ride bikes. We saw increases in the afternoon and early evening in, in, in bicycling, and even larger increases on weekends in weekend bicycling. The largest increases in cycling we found were on off-road recreational paths. And on the other hand, then we found decreases in morning peak hour cycling and in utilitarian cycling, mainly because people were working from home, they were not going to work, they were not going to school, they were not going to university. So counters along facilities that go in, in, in that direction and during the morning hours saw, saw less cycling. And it's not just that, uh, <clears throat> that people changed, but also cities changed during COVID. In some cities, such as here in, in Paris, infrastructure was just ready uh, before COVID. This is the Rue de Rivoli, which was converted into a cycling street. You can still see one lane to the left there where, 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 where buses can go through, but otherwise it's a bicycling street that has been very, very popular during COVID and still is, uh, and still is today. On top of that, the city now reduced speed limit, the speed limit in most areas of the city to 19 miles per hour. Another example here is the city of Montreal in Canada. They built about 70 kilometers of new or improved cycling facilities in 2020. We see one of them here um, with the, the orange um, bollards there to the left. They were built to a high standard, these, these COVID bike lanes, that even entire families feel safe uh, cycling there because they're separated from traffic. Um, more common, and we saw that throughout the U.S. and throughout the world, really, is um, streets closed off for cars, given over to pedestrians, cyclists, scooter riders, rollerbladers, etc. Uh, outdoor dining, um, car travel lanes taken out, contraflow bike lanes, as we see on the upper left there, or, as in many U.S. cities, neighborhood streets that were closed to, through traffic, and local traffic had to drive slowly and share the space with pedestrians and cyclists who wanted to be, to be outside. In many cities, uh, this looked a little bit like what we see here in this example for uh, Boylston Street in, in, in Boston. During COVID, they uh, installed a pop-up bike lane with these simple orange cones or, or bollards. Uh, they saw that this bike lane was very uh, uh, popular and many cyclists used it. And they made this a permanent two-way cycle track that is now there for, uh, for, for from now in, in, into the future and is very popular with cyclists. Similar example in, in Vancouver, this is Beach Avenue. You can see the orange cones they use there to, 
to block it off from, from motorized traffic. So over 10,000 bike lists on, on, in, in the summer of 2020 during certain days and was then converted into a permanent protected bike lane with concrete curbs. So they replaced the, the orange cones there with concrete curbs and it's one of the busiest uh, cycling routes. So during COVID, people changed their travel behavior, but also cities changed their infrastructure to accommodate more cyclists. Well, we have an entire chapter on uh, cycling in Latin American cities. And in fact, uh, two of the presenters uh, on the, in the, for the symposium on December 7th, uh, Carlos Felipe uh, Pardo and also Daniel Rodriguez um, were two of the three authors of that chapter. And, and they are from Bogota, uh, Colombia. Um, well, uh, we, it's a really, we, we really wanted to have this chapter because we think Latin America is a really important part of the world, which clearly is. Um, unfortunately, there are no national travel surveys available uh, for Latin American countries, which is why Latin American countries were not included in the previous uh, country uh, slides. Uh, but there are city surveys. And in fact, uh, Carlos and Daniel have been uh, at the forefront of uh, a group, whole group, actually, that collects data on uh, cycling levels, travel, tra actually travel behavior and urban transportation uh, in cities throughout Latin America. Uh, and of course, that does include cycling. What you see here, though, is tremendous variation in cycling levels among cities, uh, going from almost zero, so Quito or Lima or Valparaiso, all the way up to about 8% 8, 8 in Guadalajara, Mexico, uh, almost 7% in Bogota, 5% in Rosario and Cali, and so forth. So there's a big, big, big variation. What you don't see in this graph, but you will now, <laughs> because Ralph's going to do it, uh, is the big increases in many of these cities. So in Bogota, here you have a, an 11-fold increase over this period, uh, these are roughly two decades or so. Uh, so going from 0 0.6 to 6.6%. If you go to Santiago de Chile, about a doubling in cycling levels, 2 to 4%. You go to Buenos Aires, uh, about a nine-fold increase from 0.4 to 3.5%. These are big cities, folks, and important cities. They managed to greatly increase the uh, percentage of bike trips by bike in uh, oh, in 20 years. Not much time. Oh boy, now we have uh, a rather uh, a sad slide, but I'll tell you, we have a whole chapter on China and India. Uh, speaking of important parts of the world, uh, they're the two most populous countries in the world. Uh, so what's happening here in, uh, in China? Unfortunately, and these are very, very large cities here. Uh, you, as you can see in the bottom, the populations are listed. In virtually every single Chinese city, uh, cycling levels have declined. Um, and there are several reasons why. Number one, uh, by the way, they've also declined more than what's shown here. We're, we're reporting the official city statistics. Each city has its own. They don't have a national travel survey in China either. So it's each city has its own travel survey and they're not necessarily comparable. So in some of these, they include uh, e-bikes and some of them they don't. Uh, and most of the e-bikes in China are in fact without pedals, which means essentially they're sit down electric scooters. But anyway, um, even so the, the decline is even greater than what's shown in this chart. Why the decline? Number one, huge increases in per capita income over the past 20 years in China because of economic growth. That has led to big, big, big increases in levels of car ownership. That has led the governments uh, of these Chinese cities and the central government as well to vastly expand their roadway infrastructure. And I mean mega roads. I mean, what we would call interstate highways, motorways is what they call them in the UK. Um, and often tearing down neighborhoods as we did in the United States to build our interstates through cities um, and taking space away from uh, bicycles. So in many cases, not have not allowing bicycles at all to reuse a particular road, or at least narrowing the, the cycle path. Um, there's another reason. Uh, well, again, I'm a friend of mass transit, but Chinese cities have a lot of money, and so does the federal government, and they invest, made massive investments in improving their public transit system. So humongous increases in their metro system, such that Six of the 10 largest metro systems in the world are now in China. Um, and they also are vastly, they have by far the most uh, bus rapid transit systems of any country in the world. So the point is you have big increase, a big improvement in public transit, 
You have a lot of competition from the automobile. And on top of all that, you have rapidly growing cities, both in population size and area, meaning you have growing trip distances, which means that the, the bicycle is, becomes less feasible to cover those longer distances. Plus it has all this competition. So that's the reason for the decline. The, the central government of China, which does have a big say in what happens, it wants to turn this around. They want to appear to be sus more sustainable than, than what's happening right now. And so they've sort of given a directive to Chinese cities to try to do more to promote cycling, but it will take a while. One last point I'd like to make before we leave China was that is there is no gender gap in China when it comes to cycling. There are as many women cycling as men cycling, and all of this cycling is utilitarian cycling. There's not recreational cycling. Okay, India is a rather different story. Uh, it has a fairly high and a fairly stable, by the way, uh, level of cycling. It hasn't been declining like it has uh, in China, probably because the population, the um, per capita income hasn't been increasing like that. Uh, roughly a 20% share of cycling overall, and you might be surprised, it's a little bit higher in rural areas than it is in urban areas. So it's 22% versus 18%, uh, almost a constant share uh, over quite uh, those first four uh, city size categories from 100,000 to 2 million population, with almost all of them are either 20 or 21 percent of trips by bike. But then, as the cities get larger, so 2 to 5 million becomes 16 percent, at 5 million plus is about 9 percent. So, you might ask, well, why is there that decrease as you get to bigger cities? And, and it's sort of similar to the reason for the Chinese cities. They, these, the bigger the city, the longer the trip distance, but there's another reason as well, and that is in these smaller, I mean, sorry, in the larger uh, Chinese cities, you have much, much better public transit. So you, uh, you have a, another alternative that you're competing with. Plus, the bigger cities tend to have much higher per capita incomes than the smaller cities, which means more car ownership and more competition in that respect as well. And going in the other direction, so a city from, from 100,000 to 50,000 has very little, if any, public transit, so he doesn't have that competition um, from public transit or uh, the automobile. Uh, two points here. All of this cycling is utilitarian cycling. The other point, there is a huge gender gap here. So about six uh, among men, men have about six times, no, make six times the percentage of the trips by bike than women do. Long story as to why, but I don't have time to tell it. Next. We also see a, a gender difference uh, in, in, in bike trips in, in, in the countries displayed in, in, in this graph. In, the, in Australia, the UK, the US and Canada, only about one quarter to one third of all bike trips are made by women. That compares to uh, countries with about parity, Austria, Germany and, and Sweden, and then Denmark, the Netherlands and Japan, where women make uh, the majority of bike trips, 52, 54 and 55 percent of, of all bike trips. As evidenced here in these pictures, over 50% of bike trips in Denmark and the Netherlands are, are made by, by women. If we want to promote bicycling, we of course have to promote it for, for men as well as, as, as for women, but we also have to promote it for all ages. These pictures here show you that we can cycle at all ages. We may need special bicycles, like the tricycles they are used by the, the children uh, in, in this, the upper center, or the tricycle uh, used by the older uh, woman in the in the, in the lower half of the picture, but there you can see that the tricycle is also used to, to transport a basket and, and other things. Of course, we can cycle for utilitarian purposes and we can go cycling for recreation as the group of older adults on the, on the lower right there. Um, cycling varies a lot by age across the countries we studied. This shows you the percentage of trips made by bike by age group. And you can see for all countries, the tallest bar is for those that are not at driving age yet, those that cannot drive an automobile. After that, the percentage of trips made by bike drops um, for all the other, the other age groups. But if we look at the US and the UK on the left, we see that the percentage of trips made by bike drops as people uh, get older, and those 70 years and older only make um, less than 1% of their trips by uh, by bicycle. If we go to the other countries here, we see in Japan, we have the initial drop, but then bicycling doesn't vary by age. It stays around 12%. The same is true for Germany. It stays around 10% for all the, the age groups is played there. It drops in Denmark, but it still stays at 12 to 10% for those 65 and older. And then all the way to the right, when we look at the Netherlands, we see that those uh, 70 years and older make about one quarter, 23% 
of all of their trips by bicycle. So we can clearly keep cycling with the right policies in place and infrastructure in place into uh, older age. Another chapter in the book focuses on the growth of e-bike sales. The data here end in 2018. It would extend them to 2019 and then through the pandemic, we would see an even a steeper increase in the sale of, uh, of e-bikes. Germany is leading here, but it's followed by the other countries as well. Most of the e-bikes in this graph are so-called pedelecs, not the ones John talked about for China uh, that just have a throttle. The pedelecs only give you um, electric support when you, when you pedal. Um, they typically come in two different speed classes. One is 20 miles per hour, and then the other one, sort of a speed pedal leg, would be at 20 miles per hour. And they have been increasing in popularity in, in all countries that we, that we studied. Cycling safety is absolutely crucial to get more people on bikes, especially to get women, to get children, to get older adults on bikes. Take anyone who's risk averse to getting them on bikes, not only to make cycling in fact safer, but also to convey an, uh, how can I put it, an impression, uh, to the, give a, um, people the sense that cycling is safe. Because I think many people exaggerate how dangerous cycling is. We do want to make cycling safer, for sure. We have to make cycling safer. But I think some people think it is so uh, dangerous, they just won't even get on a bike at all. Um, it is more impo most important for these particular groups. I mean, this is what surveys show. Parents don't like their children to get on bikes because they don't think cycling is. Older adults are afraid to get on bikes for the same reason. People with disabilities are certainly probably not, not so willing to fight it out with motor vehicles and mixed traffic and anyone. I'm, I'm very risk averse myself and I'm an older adult. I'm 70 years old. So I have two reasons um, to want safe cycling facilities. Uh, and I think if you look, at the very high levels of cycling in the Netherlands, Denmark, Germany, not only high levels, but the extraordinarily broad coverage of cycling, all age groups, men and women, uh, that, that probably the greater safety, safety of cycling uh, in those three European countries probably explains why cycling is so widespread. Um, and there's a, a very close relationship, as you can see in this graph, between cycling safety and levels of cycling. Uh, uh, on the horizontal, I'm sorry, on the vertical axis, you have uh, uh, cycling safe, cycling fatalities per 100 million kilometers cycle. Uh, so that's controlling for the amount of cycling. And then on the right hand scale, you have the amount of cycling uh, per year per person. Uh, and what you feel, find is, unfortunately, we're the worst. The United States is up there in that evil, bad corner. Uh, we have not only the least cycling, but we have the most dangerous cycling. Uh, Netherlands is way down there in the lower right, has the most cycling and the safest cycling, and you can see the rest of these countries. So basically, there is a very, very strong statistical relationship between the amount of cycling and how safe it is. Now, what is the direction of causation? It goes in both directions. So first of all, if you make cycling safe, so let's just say you're providing protected bicycling facilities, safe intersection treatments for cyclists, uh, off-road bike ways, uh, and you enforce uh, the, the uh, traffic regulations intended to protect cyclists, something we rarely do in the United States, at least here in North Carolina we don't. I think motorists get away with murder, but I should keep on topic here. Um, so I think there's, we, there's many things you can do to make cycling safer, include not just infrastructure, but also sort of policies relevant to motorists to make them drive slower and uh, more to avoid endangering cyclists. Uh, but there's also the other direction of causation, that is more cycling leads to safer cycling. This is the notion of safety in numbers. How does that work? Well, the more people that cycle, um, the more visible cyclists become. The motorists sort of get used to seeing cyclists on the roadway, and they drive in a way that takes more into account and, and respects cyclists and uh, tries to avoid endangering cyclists. Another way that it works is that Take the Netherlands, for example. Well, almost every Dutch motorist is also a cyclist. <laughs> and so when you have a large percentage of your population using bikes to get around, but, and once in a while driving, it means that when they are driving, they're gonna be much, much more respectful of those cyclists that they see on the road when they're driving a car. The, the last uh, the sort of connection here is that the more 
more cyclists you have, the more public and political support you have for investing money, but not just money, space and all sorts of measures to protect cyclists and make cycling less stressful, safer, more pleasant to connect a network uh, and so forth. And also to implement those auto restrictive measures I'll, we'll talk about later. We've had some success. So we only have this, these data for five countries. And it's not that we don't think the other countries are important, but these are the only countries that have comparable national travel surveys that allow you to um, calculate rates, fatality rates per 100 million kilometers uh, cycled. Uh, it's the only fair comparison across countries. But what you see is in the UK, Germany, Denmark, Netherlands, there's been this big, big, big increase in cycling safety, or rather a decrease in the fatality rate among uh, cyclists. So uh, you have basically now have a level of one, almost the same in Germany, Denmark, and the Netherlands, a doubling in cycling safety in both Germany and Denmark over this period, which is roughly 20 years. Um, in the in Netherlands, uh, it was already low, so you have still a 50%, 60% decrease in the fatality rate. Even in the UK, you have almost a three-fold increase in cycling safety. And then we get the United States, we sort of made progress over the first decade, going from 7.2, then we went way up to 6.0. Why? Well, it's not the fault of cyclists. I would just like to emphasize, it is not, I repeat, the fault of cyclists. It's not what cyclists are doing, it's what motorists are doing. What are they doing? Uh, they're driving while drunk. In, uh, in all of these other countries, the rate of drunk driving has been declining. In the United States, it's been increasing. They're speeding. In all of these other four countries, the percentage of motorists caught speeding has fallen in the United States. It has risen. Motorists are increasingly speeding in the United States. That makes things more dangerous, obviously, for the um, cyclists. Um, in addition to which, we've had a very large increase in the percentage of personal vehicles that are big, that are mega pickup trucks, large SUVs, and uh, minivans as well, as well as lots of delivery vehicles. Um, and we say, oh, there was undistracted driving. Of course, now, in terms of, I must say, these other, these European countries also have had a trend in increasing um, um, percentages of SUVs and so forth, not so much pickup trucks, but SUVs and, and minivans, but not nearly as much as in the United States. Um, and distracted driving, I think, is a problem throughout the world. It just is. But it is really a problem in the United States. Why? Because police don't give a damn. I'm sorry, I'm not supposed to use those sorts of words, but I don't think police give a damn and the courts don't either. They just do not enforce laws that prohibit texting while driving or cell phone use in general. And there's lots of other things that distract drivers as well. I mean, they're basically not paying attention anyway. Um, anyway, that's an unfortunate trend and we really need to do something about it. Yeah, Tom, we, have to, we have to speed up a little bit. Okay, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> okay, so. I had the pleasure of working on the chapter here with the York flooded to Paris. And there's good news here. So uh, this is over about 30 years. Uh, you have big, big, big increases in, in cycling in all three of these cities. And these are very good, very famous. They're very populous. They're very important, a world city. So you have almost, uh, I guess, a three and a half fold increase in cycling in New York. You have a doubling in Greater London, and that's really the, the way they term it, is Greater London. Uh, and in Paris, uh, there's a 12-fold increase uh, in cycling. So the biggest winner here in terms of this, not exactly a race, um, but the biggest increase in Paris, but that's partly because the definition of Paris is a little bit narrower. Okay, fatality rates. This is corresponds to the graph I showed before. As cycling levels have increased, as a percentage of trips in those three countries, You've had a big decline in traffic fatalities per amount of cycling and a decline in uh, serious injury rates, meaning by having to be hospitalized overnight. So you have this, this again, the, the safer cycling has led to more cycling, more cycling has led to safer cycling, both in terms of fatalities and serious injuries. And this is one of the ways they did it. <laughs> that is protected bike lanes or cycle tracks sometimes they're called, uh, but they're protected. They're separated, physically separated from motor vehicle traffic. Um, you can see how it's done here in London and for a big band and uh, here on the Seine in, in Paris. 
Um, in New York, that's uh, Ninth Avenue looking south, I'm pretty sure. And, and here, it's, it's a little bit uh, sort of more things going on than you see in the other two. But uh, you can see there's a special uh, green light for the uh, cyclist continuing uh, ahead and a special do not turn red light uh, for motorists. And that's to prevent right turning motorists and at other intersections preventing left turning motorists from running over cyclists, which is a big source of serious cycling injuries and deaths. Um, but you can see here in New York, they do it a somewhat different way, but they adjust the intersection. They have the intersection modification combined with the protection along the right of way of this uh, protected bike lane or cycle track. Makes things much less stressful. Here's one, uh, this is a, um, it used to be called, as you can see on the pavement here, uh, it used to be called Cycling Superhighway. Now they've rebranded it as a, simply a cycleway. And this, they've done this throughout London. But this is definitely, these are not recreational cyclists. These are commute, daily commuters commuting to work in, in uh, the center of London. And you can see uh, that uh, on the left, that it's completely protected uh, by these physical barriers, both from bus traffic and any kind of motor vehicle traffic. So it makes it safer and makes it less stressful. Um, and uh, they have a whole network. That's the other thing that's important, that these are connected cycleways. It's not just one here and one there. Next. So John already talked about the improved cycling facilities that are needed to encourage more cycling and make it safer. It's also important to this traffic calming of residential neighborhoods where cyclists can share the roadways with drivers because of lower speed and low traffic volume. But also mixed use is important to keep trip distances short enough to be bikeable for most integrating cycling with public transport to facilitate longer trip distances, restrictions on motor vehicles, and we'll talk about that a little bit later, but restricting uh, speed, restricting access, uh, reducing parking, uh, etc. Of course, we need improved traffic education for motorists and also for cyclists. We need traffic regulations that protect cyclists and that are enforced to protect cyclists. And there are many special events and promotional campaigns that can be implemented to make cycling more attractive and win people over to become cyclists. Um, this graph here shows you about 20 cities in uh, Australia, Latin America, Europe, and, 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 North, and North America. And all of these cities over the time frame stated there have uh, increased their network of cycling uh, facilities. Uh, and at the same time, they've all seen an increase in bicycling. There's lots of variability because different cities started with different lengths of bikeway networks at different levels of cycling that they already had. What they all have in common though is they all saw a decline in fatalities and severe injuries relative to the cycling levels. So cycling has gotten safer in all of these cities as they built the networks and as the cycling levels um, increased. As John has already said, many cities have implemented these um, cycle tracks or protected bike lanes. This shows you the trend in the US as a nationwide trend, about a 14 fold increase between 2006 and 2018. If we extend the data to today, we see even steeper increases since 2018 and continued growth. They look slightly different in, in different uh, countries. On the upper left, we have uh, Copenhagen uh, in Denmark. And if you look at the center of the picture in the back, you see uh, there's a little curb separating the cycle track from motorized traffic. There will be another curb separating the cyclists from the pedestrians through the intersections. They are carrying it in this bright blue color. On the upper right, you see Bogota, Colombia with these uh, orange or yellow caps that separate the two-way cycle track there from the motorized traffic. On the left, we have Montreal in Canada, this sort of <clears throat> legacy, using that term again, uh, city in terms of cycle tracks in, in North America. And they are separating their cyclists with a little concrete curb here from motorized traffic. And then in Seville, Spain on the right, uh, they're using a fence uh, to separate the cyclists uh, from motorized traffic. This gives you an impression what, what it feels like to be on a bike in different environments. This is in, in Vancouver and in Canada. This is before a cycle track was installed. The cyclist is in traffic. There's sort of a, a sign on the street, but clearly the motorized traffic is all around the cyclist. And then with these planters that separate uh, cyclists from motorized traffic, you get a whole different feel and a whole different feeling of, of safety and actual safety in, uh, in, in, in bicycling there. And uh, there's a new trend Oh, one, I jumped over one. Uh, this shows you the uh, bicycling cycle tracks in, in, in Australia. Again, separating cyclists with um, a curb, with, with greenery. Um, 
And then, of course, on the upper left, we have a very important element of every bikeway network and as a bridge. Um, roadways, highways, uh, rivers, parts of a harbor uh, can be big barriers for cyclists. And so building uh, exclusive bicycle bridges or building uh, bicycling paths along uh, uh, motorized uh, motor, motor traffic uh, bridges is very important to facilitate cycling. Cyclists typically do not feel comfortable crossing a bridge with high levels and fast moving motorized traffic because there's nowhere to go if a car is, is swerving into your lane on a, on a bridge. A new trend we discovered are these bicycle expressways. They typically connect the hinterland to the city, but they also run through cities. And what they typically do is they are separate from motorized traffic, they separate pedestrians and cyclists, and they, at intersections, they have either tunnels or they have bridges. And this does two things. A, it speeds up cycling because you do not have to wait at red lights at these intersections. And, but more importantly, it increases safety because you're separated from motorized traffic and you do not have to, you don't have the traffic danger at these, uh, at these intersections. In the center here, we see one of these projects that John alluded to with the Chinese central government uh, encouraging cities to build bicycling facilities to increase cycling again. This is in Beijing. This is an elevated bicycle expressway. So it's above um, the buildings and it's above the roadways and gives cyclists a, a right of way there that, that's safe and that's, uh, that's comfortable. In the US, we have some of these things that may be similar to these bicycling expressways. Parts of the Cherry Creek Trail in Denver, for example, are separating pedestrians and cyclists. The Midtown Greenway in Minneapolis has the pedestrians on the right-hand side of the white line there and the cyclists uh, to the left, but it's much more common to have what, we, what is there on the Minuteman Trail in, in, in Boston to have pedestrians and, uh, and cyclists uh, share the space. This is uh, in Santa Barbara. Um, as many of you, you may know, um, two car lanes uh, were converted into a bike path and a very attractive walkway uh, on, on, on the other side. Um, this is in uh, Chicago, the Lakefront Trail. Uh, you can see how close it is to downtown, 100, over 100,000 users on a typical summer weekend, but it's not just recreational, it's also used by long distance commuters that go into the city and come out of the city in a very, very nice uh, facility there. Again, from Chicago, very important uh, bridge or a flyover uh, over an intersection at Grand and Illinois Avenues, uh, allowing cyclists to, to connect uh, on the trails there without interacting with, with traffic. You don't always have to go over, you can also go under. Some of you may know this, this is the bikeway underpass at UC uh, Santa Barbara in, in, in California. There's a new trend, in, and I, I think I heard Dave talk about that in the introduction, but focusing on, on intersections and not just on the, the, the links of the bicycling network. This is a, a Dutch import uh, to Salt Lake City. This is a Google, a Google Maps uh, shot, and it's this Dutch style protected intersection. And the, the safety comes from these but we dubbed safety islands here. So what is happening is that a, a motor vehicle that starts into the intersection it cannot make a, a right turn and, and, and cut across. They are forced to travel into the intersection and make a slow turn around that safety island. What that does is it increases visibility of the cyclist for the motorist because they are going into the intersection. They have a longer time to see the cyclist. And then second, when the cyclist and the motorist meet, the travel speed is so much slower that A, a crash can be avoided, or if there is a crash, it's of lower, uh, it's of lower impact. And of course, once the cyclist is across, they can continue straight, or they can start queuing here to do a two-stage two uh, left turn and then continue in, in two phases. This is uh, a graph from the city of Amsterdam in the Netherlands. Everything in red you see here are bike paths and bike lanes. There's some orange there. These are planned bike paths and bike lanes, and this shows you a a bikeway network of a city with mass uh, bicycling. On top of the bikeways here, of course, you have neighborhood streets that are traffic calmed, where car travel speeds are low and car travel uh, volumes are low, so bicyclists can share that. This is a truly connected network. And important to keep in mind, Amsterdam has not always been that way. This shows you the same street in 1971 and 2020. And you see in 1971, they're going the same way the US and many other countries went. Bicyclists are relegated to the side of the roadway. The car is dominating. You can almost feel the, the air pollution coming out of that picture when you look in the, in the distance there. Today, this is a bicycle street with parked bicycles, bicycles in the center and pedestrian walkway on the side. Again, a policy decision to make the city more bike friendly. A similar example here from a German city, small German city, about 70,000 inhabitants. In the 1950s, after the second world war, we have a trolley running. We have some bicycles there. 
we have a car and we have that fountain. That fountain will be important for the next picture. But as the US and many other places, there was urban renewal and the whole city, there's the fountain, the whole city was redesigned around the automobile. And in fact, this is a postcard. So the city thought this is so great. Let's put this on a postcard and show the world what we have achieved. And what they had achieved was a city that's catering to the car. Pedestrians and bikes are pushed to the side, even so much that the, the red Volkswagen or Porsche is almost hitting the, the little blonde boy uh, standing there. Again, forwarding another 20 to 30 years again by local policy decisions today, the ugly building is still there, but there's the fountain. But today this is an intersection that's for pedestrians and for cyclists only and motorized traffic is, is banned. So it's a redesigning of the city to focus again on pedestrians and cyclists. The last one of this series is again, a German city of Freiburg, this time a little bit larger, 220,000 inhabitants. Again, in 1950s, we have a trolley running, we have some cars, by local policy decisions, focusing on the automobile by 1960, the trolley is gone, it's the mode of the past, the car is the mode of the future, the city is designed around the automobile. Changing local policy today, this is a bicycle bridge. Cars are not allowed to cross it. Uh, they build a new uh, trolley bridge right next to this bridge and the pedestrians can walk on this, the side of the, of the blue things here. Again, local policy decisions shape our travel options in, in cities. This is an example of two cities that are following in Amsterdam's footsteps. On the top, we have Portland, Oregon. In 1990, you see in black their bikeway network, a couple of lines there. And in the background, the, the, the salmon color that gets yellow and later will get red shows you the bike commute levels. And the more yellow and the more red there is, the more bike commuting there is. On the bottom, we have Seville in Spain in 2005, before a pro-bike city government came in, a couple of bike ways in, in green there. Advancing 10 years on top in Portland, you see how much the bikeway network has grown and how much the colors in the city centers are start changing from yellow to red. So bicycling is increasing. A big jump in three years only at the bottom in Seville, Spain, because the city government came in with the promise to promote bicycling, a huge expansion in bikeway networks in a short time period. Again, on top, another 14 years, the bikeway network in Portland has grown ever more dense and connected and bike commuting levels have, have skyrocketed. At the bottom, Another 10 years in Seville, also the bikeway network has gotten denser and denser and more, more user-friendly and, and better for, for cyclists. It's crucial to expand and improve your cycling infrastructure, but there's another really important thing you have to do, and that's slow down cars. Uh, this is a graph from the World Health Organization, actually it relates mainly to pedestrians here, but you can see that the faster the car is going, uh, it just exponentially increases the likelihood that the pedestrian is going to be killed. And it's very similar for the cyclist as well. The key speed, uh, or threshold, I guess you would call it, is 30 kilometers an hour, which is 19 miles an hour. And above that, you can see just a huge, I mean, really exponential increase in the likelihood that a pedestrian or a cyclist is going to get killed in a crash with an automobile. So it is absolutely crucial to slow down cars. Um, and one of the ways you can do that is by traffic calming neighborhoods. Uh, and if you do that, you don't necessarily even need any cycling facilities at all separate on these particular uh, neighborhood streets. So how do they do it? First of all, officially, there's a 30 kilometer per hour speed limit or 19 miles per hour. It's important to note that traffic calming in these European cities is area wide. It's not just one street here, one street there, because motorists are a little bit more clever than that, and they'll just go to the street to not traffic calm. So this is truly area wide coordinated traffic calming that cannot be avoided, uh, except by stay, staying out of these residential neighborhoods. Um, and also just these, this is a very typical kind of traffic calm street. So you have maybe 50 to 80% of streets and residential streets rather in, in the German and Dutch neighborhoods uh, that are traffic out in this way. You'll note, looking at the picture, one of the ways you use, you narrow the street, especially at the entry to the street. You have, you can see it, it could be much wider, but they've made it about half the width um, in order to deliberately slow down any cars that are using this street. Next one, Ralph. And this is uh, an example in London. Uh, and even though they speak English, they are now increasingly traffic, traffic calming their neighborhoods. They call them uh, low traffic neighborhoods, LTNs, uh, and they have a speed limit of 20 miles per hour. They still do miles like we do, 
for some reason. Anyway, you can see how have they done it. They've narrowed the street. You have here this special sort of a cobblestone kind of a, I'm not sure if it's a crosswalk or whatever it does, it slows down uh, any sort of a motor vehicle that's going across it. You can also see that it's, it's a dead end for cars. Cars are not allowed to go beyond that point. So what it does, it creates a blockage for cars within neighborhoods, uh, which means those streets, those neighborhoods cannot be used for the rat running that motorists want to do. Uh, and there's, the through traffic doesn't belong in neighborhoods anyway. So these sorts of facilities help to eliminate that through traffic. Um, and this is another way to do it. This is in uh, up, up, I'm gonna say upstairs. <laughs> On the top is uh, Montreal and the bottom is Quebec. Uh, these are diverters uh, and they clearly have pass-throughs for the cyclists and obviously for pedestrians, uh, but they make them dead ends for cars. And you need to do that. You wanna keep out through traffic. And the next slide shows you the same sort of thing in Melbourne, Australia. Um, it's, maybe it maybe doesn't look quite as fancy, but uh, that used to be obviously just a, a regular street, which was just inviting through traffic uh, that didn't want to get caught in traffic congestion on the main arterials, but th that through traffic doesn't belong in, in residential neighborhoods. And so they installed these bollards and obviously you have pass-throughs uh, for the cyclists uh, and the cars then just don't choose this neighborhood to go through. Uh, an example here, this is from Chicago. Uh, one of the big trends really throughout North America, um, and that is it started out sort of in Vancouver and the Northwest and Portland, uh, what we call bike boulevards, which were basically traffic calm streets that were optimized in various ways to facilitate cycling. So you would have, for example, stop signs for the, per, for the perpendicular streets, but not on this street and various other accommodations as well. You'll see there's a 20 mile per hour speed limit. Uh, so they've traffic calmed the street in that way. And, uh, and this, by the way, just I forgot to mention, uh, they're increasingly called now, not so much bike boulevards, but neighborhood greenways or urban greenways to emphasize that this is not just for the benefit of cyclists. It's also for pedestrians, for kids who are playing in the neighborhoods, for cleaner air in the neighborhoods, for less noisy neighborhoods, that everyone's really benefiting from this. And so most cities have now uh, taken over this uh, terminology of neighborhood greenway or urban greenway. You'll note it, they com they're composed of different kinds of components. Some of them you'll see, uh, this is a contraflow bike lane and some sections you don't need any special facility at all. When you get on a heavier, travel street, uh, you have a protected bike lane. Okay. Uh, this might surprise you. This is a very, very typical scene. Uh, in fact, I took the picture on the upper left. Um, this is a scene from uh, a German suburb, two different German suburbs. Uh, and what you'll see is this is a fully shared street. And if you look at the sign upper left and lower right, that is the sign for such a street. It means completely shared street and motorists must yield to other uses of the street, non-motorized users, so to bicyclists, to children playing in the street, to pedestrians. This is meant to be, in a sense, almost an extension of your front yard. Uh, and it is very strictly enforced and it works extremely well. And these are normally within overall, they're sort of parts of overall traffic calm neighborhood, uh, neighborhoods. Uh, but you'll see that the speed limit by law anyway is five to seven kilometers per hour, which oh my goodness, I guess that's three to five miles per hour or something like that. Uh, and the thing is, it, look, it doesn't, you don't even need any special infrastructure. You, you're not able to sidewalk or a bike lane and it works great. Uh, so I think it's, uh, um, it's been very successful in Germany. It's, it's just spreads and spreads. Next. Here we want to show you a different kind of a shared street. This is from uh, Vienna, Austria. This is a main shopping street. The speed limit is 20 kilometers per hour, but the roadway is shared by pedestrians, cyclists, cars, inline skaters, scooter riders, what have you. And motorists have to yield, even though they could go 20 kilometers per hour, they have to yield to the other users. And you can see how these different modes in this main shopping street in, in, in Vienna, Austria can uh, coexist uh, by yielding to each other and having a slow speed. On the right-hand side here, where the blue cyclist is at the moment, you see there's some car parking, but it's not permanent. It's only for pickup and drop-off uh, for the local uh, businesses uh, 
on, on this side. And you can see how the, the cars here are, are yielding to the, uh, to the other, other roadway users. Um, of course, you know, uh, car-free zones in, in, in California. This is the car-free zone in, uh, on the UC uh, Davis campus. And this is another uh, car-free zone on the UC Santa Barbara uh, campus, also in California. Uh, quickly getting towards the end of the presentation, there are many other policies that help to promote cycling. One of them is bike transit integration. This typically happens by either having the bike on the public transport vehicle, so either on the bus, as you see on the, on the top right there, 80%, 85% of US buses now have bike racks in front of them, or taking the bicycle on, on trains or subways, typically on special cars, at special doors, sometimes during special hours. Much more common, is a uh, bike parking at train station. Train stations, as we see here in DC, uh, Freiburg, Germany, and Groningen in the Netherlands. These bike parking garages can have different sizes and they can be free or they can be for pay. Typically when you pay, you also get some sort of surveillance watching over your bike. So not just protecting it from the weather, but also protecting it from, uh, from theft. Bike parking is also important throughout the city. As we see there in, in Portland, Oregon, two car parking spaces taking out for a bike parking corral for about 20 bikes and you can have bicycling machines, bicycling robots, as we see there in Nagoya in Japan, where you put your bicycle in, some of them go up, some of them go down, they park your bicycle and you can retrieve your bike through the little uh, kiosk, uh, the little computer you see there within a minute or so. Uh, other policies to promote bicycling include uh, cyclovias. These are events where streets are closed for motorized traffic for certain hours, days, weekends, weeks, and longer periods, showing people what it would be like to use that space for another use than moving uh, cars and, and, and parking or storing cars. Bike sharing has been very successful in attracting um, different users uh, to bicycling, particularly those who don't want to bother about the maintenance of the bike, who don't want to fear about theft, who may live in an apartment and don't have bike parking spaces, or those who live up a couple of flights of stairs and do not want to carry uh, their, their, their bicycles up. Many events like Bike to Work Day that happens in the US annually entice uh, commuters to ride to work, also trip end facilities like at showers and, and, and lockers. They also bike to school programs, enticing children to ride their bike to school. Bike training is important in, in Germany, the Netherlands and Denmark. Kids get training in school in between third, second and third grade. They get training in the classroom, training on, on in, in little traffic gardens, and then training out in the, in, the, in, in the real world. In the US, DC has such a program but other than that, bike training is, is really voluntary for children. There's also bike training for adults, which is very important because uh, many people have not ridden bikes in the US for a long time, and they may wanna get comfortable again and knowing the rules of the road on a bike. Training of motorists is really, really important. Motorists have to know about the rules of the road and the rights uh, of bicyclists and pedestrians and how to protect them and avoid uh, hitting them. Last, many cities are using uh, biannual reports to benchmark uh, bicycling. They keep track of data like cyclist safety, bikeway infrastructure, cycling levels, opinion about bicycling, and they use them also as political goals to uh, achieve over time. Hold on folks, only two more slides. Okay, implementation. You know, you can have the best ideas in the world, but if you can't implement them, they're worthless. Uh, so it's absolutely crucial. Uh, that we, in fact, the last three chapters in the book are dedicated exclusively to implementation. Uh, even the chapter on Portland and Sevilla, it's a step-by-step -step detailed explanation of how they did what they did. Um, it's really necessary to publicize both the individual and the societal benefits, include citizen participation, make, make the citizens feel like they're part of this planning process. If something's controversial, implement it in stages. We've seen this again and again in so many cities around the world. You've got to combine the incentives for cycling, so really nice connected cycling facilities and these pro-bike policies and programs, uh, but you got to include disincentives for car use, reduced speed, reduced parking availability, reduced time of parking, increased price of parking. Um, all those things we talked about in terms of traffic calming, not allowing through traffic through, through neighborhoods, and you absolutely have to have those sorts of disincentives for car use and, and combine those with the incentives uh, for cycling. And um, uh, it's absolutely crucial. Advocacy at every level, national, state, and local is absolutely crucial for generating the public and political support to get 
get the necessary infrastructure policies and programs uh, implemented. Next slide. I'll make this short. First of all, safe cycling infrastructure, well designed, safe, well connected, is absolutely crucial. It's absolutely necessary, but it's not sufficient. As Ralph showed two slides previously, you have to complement the infrastructure programs with policies and programs such as he mentioned, as a, the um, education programs and wayfinding, we didn't mention that too much, but parking policies and, uh, and also the disincentives to car use that I mentioned before. Uh, the last thing I'll mention is the crucial issue of equity and social justice, which we emphasize in every single chapter of this book. Uh, MIT Press wanted us to do it and we wanted to do it. So there is a separate chapter specifically on equity and social justice, but we asked chapter authors of every chapter topic, please consider for your topic, the key uh, theme of social justice and equity. Um, and that must be really key to all of our programs and policies and infrastructure as well. It's all too often you find that the best cycling infrastructure, that all of the bike uh, bike sharing programs uh, and various other things are sort of in the higher income parts of cities. And then in lower income neighborhoods and marginalized communities that there's very little, and that just is not right. And we need to do something about it. And I'm very proud of Cal Bike for having explicitly made the decision to include uh, explicitly, advocate, to include social justice and equity in all the future decision making. Uh, of Cal Bike um, in the future. Okay, that's the end of this. We are, I am so, 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 so sorry that um, uh, we, we went over the time. It's all Ralph's fault because he talks too much, of course. <laughs> but this is the book. If you'd like more details, you might want to take a copy, uh, take a look at a copy of the book. And um, there it is. Now we're ready for questions. And, and the difficult ones, by the way, Ralph's going to answer. <laughs> All right, thank you. Thank you so much for that. We really appreciate it. Everyone uh, in the chat and the questions is talking about how much they appreciate it. Um, real quickly, we got to jam some questions down here. Lots of good ones. Uh, I'll start with the last one from David Moore, who asks about the connection between land use and bike infrastructure. What have you learned in your review of various cities uh, about the relative importance of having the land uses that support cycling compared to having the infrastructure that supports cycling. I'll say one thing, but then Ralph knows in general more about land use. I, that is, for example, when new German and Dutch and Danish suburbs are developed, they come fully equipped with cycling facilities. That's just the way they're made and new developments are not allowed. They're, they just are not even permitted without having full uh, and well-connected, well-designed cycling facilities. Ralph, you might want to say something else about this. Yes, there is, there is a clear connection to, to, to land uses, also to the location of, of, of bikeways. So bicycling can support land uses, bicycling can support businesses. Many studies have shown that by now that and I think um, Susan Handy over there in, in California has also run some studies that show that businesses benefit from access with bike parking and, and access to bike ways. Of course, the land use element is the, the trip distance element as well. And we have to keep trip distances short enough to be, to be bikeable. But we've seen, especially looking at, um, at data for, for European cities, that bicycling in suburban areas and then even in, in, in small town areas is relatively high. So we're talking about 10% uh, of trips of trips made by bike there because the land use is still right that you can get to a shop you can get to a town center you can get to a village center so the land use is crucial to keep trip distances short enough to to be to be bikeable but the bicycle can even go in areas where public transport can't easily go because of the density that public transport needs if, if well, one last word on that and that is it's explicit federal state and local policy in germany not to allow sprawl. And so the kind of low density sprawl development we find around every metropolitan area in the United States, it's simply illegal. You can't do it in the Netherlands. You can't do it in Germany. You can't do it in Denmark. So, I mean, it, it, part of it is just 
I know it's very difficult for us to do that here in the United States, um, even in California, which is at the forefront of everything, but it's, it's specific, explicit government regulations that just don't allow it. And one, one, one last point, sorry about this, is the, 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 the land use matters, but then also the bikeway infrastructure matters. So coming, as my accent may give away, coming from, from Europe, living in, in New Jersey first here, here in the US, very often the land use was, was right. New Jersey is relatively dense, um, in terms of population, but often you could see your trip's destination, but it was across six lanes of highway. There was no way you could ever get to your destination. So if we don't provide access across short distances, um, even the short distance in terms of land use does not help the cyclist uh, to get there. So I'm gonna ask a question that's sort of synthesizing a few of the questions that have been coming in. And that's about political will. Um, it seems like that's a really key difference between Europe and the United States. Do you have any like, sort of, what are your kind of top couple of insights about how we can get the political will in the US to, to make some of these changes? You know, it's, it's interesting because um, all, as Ralph showed in those sort of over time uh, photographs, uh, it, it really changed a lot. I mean, if you look at the 1950s, 1960s, and almost all of those European countries, they were gung-ho for cars and more roads, and they thought the United States was the model to follow. And then the 1970s, with the environmental movement, the energy crisis, uh, and so forth and so on, uh, they just said, this is a disaster. This is really, I mean, people are getting killed, our air is polluted, and, and so forth. And they just it took that, it was sort of a, one of the, I guess, catalysts that led to then there was additional policies that, well, it's, there are other reasons also for supporting cycling and for restricting uh, car use. Um, but it, it's really a matter, a lot of it is a matter of um, public relations, of getting the message out there as to just how important this is for health, for practically getting around, for increased mobility for everyone, which is sort of been an equity issue. But Ralph, say something about the uh, case of Frankfurt, because that's, I think, a especially interesting case. Yes, so I mean, it, it varies by city, also in, in, in Europe, and very often the successful cases are, are excluded. You'll often hear, oh, we are not Freiburg, we are not Münster, you can't do this here, even in, with, with, within Germany. And Germans love their cars. Uh, Germany, car industry is very, very important for employment and for exports and, and all sorts of things. And so we did a case study on the city of Frankfurt, which was not a bicycle-oriented city, and we were interested in how did it happen that they now have 20% of and what happened in Frankfurt was sort of a, a very slow bit by bit uh, approach. Um, they hired their uh, bike planner in, in 2000 to 2005. They were alone in the city administration and they had to make uh, relationships. They had to make relationships with other traffic engineers. They had to gain trust of the traffic engineers. They had to get relationships with land use planners, with urban developers. And they tried to insert bicycling in all sorts of, of decisions, often when repaving was done of roadways where there was excess capacity, they were able to squeeze in a bike lane. Um, when there was a new bridge built, if they got informed about it, they maybe could put in a bike lane. Um, they tried to put in a lot of, of, of bike parking, uh, parking racks at intersections when citizens called for greater safety at intersections to increase visibility. They put in bike parking to keep cars from parking too close to the intersection. But over time and bit by bit, they were able to increase the convenience of cycling. And with that, cycling increased and the demand for better cycling facilities and better bikeway infrastructure and the relationships within the city administration increased. So cycling went from a, a fringe mode bit by bit over the years towards what John had alluded to this, this referendum where they had enough signatures to sort of force the city and the city didn't hold a referendum. They just did it by themselves because they knew the referendum was coming um, to then declare we wanna be a bicycle city and they have all this money lined up and all these plans of how to become a bike friendly city. That would not have been possible without these baby steps in the beginning, starting with the low hanging fruit, starting with making these, these relationships and they would have never gotten, gotten there in, in, one, in one fell swoop. The, the other thing I'd like just to add here is to take an American example, look at Portland, Oregon. I know now everyone thinks, oh, well, yeah, sort of a weird city and you know that's not typical well in 1990 it was as car oriented and had as little cycling as almost any other american city it was it was totally normal and in that in chapter 19 
Roger Geller, who is the, one of the co-authors, and he's the bike planner for, for Portland, describes in, I'm not gonna say excruciating, in great detail, in really uh, illuminating detail, exactly how, what was the process that the city of Portland went through, both to the government agencies, the planners, public relations, advocates, and so forth, that led to a situation where Portland became one of the top bicycling cities in the United States. And then the same thing it, it, um, in the case study of the same chapter 19 of Seville, Spain, it's exactly the same, step by step, in detail, how was this done? How did they get these policies, incredibly dramatic improvement in cycling policies over this period of time? So, I mean, at least in the book, chapter 19 really goes into that in great detail. Great, thank you. So we only have a few minutes and we have a bunch of questions. I'm just gonna roll through them quickly and I'm gonna answer um, most of them myself uh, and get your feedback on them. Uh, uh, Marie from Bike Monterey asks about e-bikes and throttles and our concern and position about that. And we just, I just want to say that we love e-bikes because the expansion of bicycling that it provides, but throttles uh, are blurring the line between e-bikes and motorcycles and there are safety implications. We're going to address that in detail at the summit in person, a very sober analysis of the rise of e-bikes so that we know what we're getting into and how we can leverage that uh, appropriately. That'll be in April, please come. Um, uh, Rock Miller asks a, an appropriate goal for, uh, Cal for bike mode share in California. Caltrans says 3%, he says that's too low. And I agree, um, but that is a statewide goal in order to get 3% statewide, the cities need to be 10%. Uh, you know, that's the only way to get to 3%. So it's not as low as it sounds. Um, Donovan Lacey asks about addressing the perception of improved bicycle infrastructure as a form of gentrification in marginalized communities. And that's a thing, that's a real thing. We've seen that uh, all over California. And I think it's a factor of the, the pitiful small amount of infrastructure and improvements that we make in this state, the what happens is that we only make improvements where there are already privileged communities or an gentrifying neighborhood where there's a new group of people who are disproportionately white and privileged, and they are the ones who are advocating for the change. And as the newcomers, and with a natural opposition to change, people perceive it as uh, a part of the bad gentrification, and they oppose it. Uh, understandably, the answer is to. Uh, you know, 10 times the amount of money that we spend on bike infrastructure so that we can do it in communities that aren't gentrified, uh, uh, in communities that need it the most anyway. And that's CalBike's position is to really focus uh, those improvements in the communities that need it the most so that it's not just, uh, you know, part of the, the arrow of gentrification. Um, and then finally, uh, this is, I'll give you a chance to respond. We'll go a little over 130, sorry folks. Um, uh, cities that have done rapid Im improvements, you know, we're doing it so darn incrementally. Uh, I know that Seville uh, is one of those cities that went from what, like 1% to 6% in three years. Um, can you think of other cities? What, what, what are some other cities that have done uh, such a great boost and what can we learn from them? Oh, Bogota for sure. Uh, and we saw the example of Buenos Aires. I mean, that was a nine-fold increase. Uh, I mean, none of those, those were not uh, bike-oriented cities. Uh, you have the doubling in, in um, Santiago uh, in the United States. I mean, there has, at least that's a percentage of um, the way, for city data in the United States, it's mainly the uh, ACS, the American Community Survey, which is the percentage of uh, workers. Um, but Washington certainly has had a, I think it's a quadrupling or a five or six fold increase uh, in cycling. So, I mean, it, that, that's considerable. Um, and, and then you have Frankfurt. I mean, okay, Ralph, it's your turn to think of some examples now. I mean, all the examples John made are, are longer than, than three years. There are very few examples that are able to do it in such a short period because you really need a political mandate. That's what it was in Seville. There was a government coming in that said, we're going to traffic come. Uh, pedestrianize the city, the inner city area, we're going to build bikeways, we're going to gonna go out and, and be car restrictive. And they had a political mandate to do that. Uh, they were um, in, in government, I think, for six, seven years. Then another government came in and, and stopped a lot of the bicycling expansion. And then there was again a flip and the bike promotion continued. I, I don't think there are many examples that 
do it in, in three years. Paris, France, maybe the current city to, to watch. They're really aggressively expanding bikeway networks. They're reducing car, spe car, car uh, speed limits. They're reducing car parking. They're very aggressively pushing in that direction. And that may result in some faster uh, results, but typically it takes, it takes longer than three years to see these, these changes because people also have to change their, their behavior as well. Well, you saw it from the graph, Paris really is making humongous problems. I mean, a 12-fold increase of the bike mode share in 20 years. I mean, that's really impressive. But I mean, the, the local government and the regional government and the federal government are in, in favor of doing this. Back, uh, one of the, the co-authors actually of the chapter on New York, Paris, and London, uh, Emmanuel de Levasin is French, obviously, and he works for the French Ministry of Sustainable Development. He used to be in the French Ministry of Transport. He was also working for the city of Paris. And he said even he never thought this would be possible. Uh, he, he likes to work every day. And he said when he saw Rudel Hivokliti, he said he never thought he would see such a thing in his lifetime. So what we think is impossible can be made possible. <laughs> and I mean, there's huge public support. Uh, and it's just a matter of, and, and to show when something works that you have one success that can build upon another success and another success. And so it's really important when you do have a success, publicize it, <laughs> let people know about it um, and don't keep it a secret. I think it's really, really important. That's really, it's, I, I can't emphasize how important it is to generate that public uh, and political, so well, the public support and the media support and generates then the political support as well. Right. You, it's, it's not automatic. Just building a facility and having it successful isn't enough. You really need to work with the media and with everyone you can find at every government level. And that's what bike, that's what CalBike does. I mean, and all of your local advocacy groups there in California. I mean, as I said at the very beginning, it's just the progress that American cities have made. And this is, goes for Canada as well. It would never have been possible without the advocacy groups. Velo Quebec, for example, I mean, all that's, everything that's wonderful that's happened in Montreal, and Quebec City, and so forth. I mean, it's really a lot of it. It's the, uh, the result of Velo Quebec working. Then they have people within the Ministry of Transport of Quebec who are very bike friendly and they get to work by bike. And so they get, they get to the engineers and so forth. It, it, it really is possible. Uh, it's, it's, but one thing I must, in the United States, because of, of our sprawl, lower density suburban areas, we don't have land use policies as they do in Europe that basically prohibit low density sprawl. Uh, and so that's probably our biggest challenge is what's going on in the suburbs. It's, it's been, for example, if you look at New York City, New York City itself has been quite successful and now Minneapolis or Portland, have been, they've been very successful in improving conditions for cycling in the city itself. Well, you, you have a lot to teach us, John. It's, if you go out to the suburbs, it's another world. I, 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 uh, I wish you could stay longer. And I'm not gonna put you on the spot with a solid answer, but I'll at least ask if you are willing to consider coming to Oakland in April. I'll consider it. Sharing your knowledge, right on. And That's I'll wear great. this hat. <laughs> All right, Ralph, I hope you too. We'll consider We'd coming. Be, and home. partly because we be want to see event. all these great people out there in California, including our colleagues who are coming, Daniel Rodriguez and, and Carlos, uh, Carlos Philippe and Susan Handy and, and all these other people. Great. Um, you know it or not, Californians, you are wonderful. Great. That's great. Uh, with that, we will close. I'll thank everybody for coming out to uh, this first symposium. Look forward to seeing you on December 7th, uh, the second one, February 22nd at the third and April 6th in Oakland for the in-person event. Uh, remember, you can uh, get a free copy of the book, Cycling for Sustainable Cities, if you sign up for the summit by midnight today. Thanks to everyone. Thank you, for Jen. Also, thank you, Stephanie, Kevin in the background, uh, Cynthia Rose, our board chair. Um, thank you, uh, everyone, for your uh, contributions. Vielen Dank, as the Germans would say. Thank you very much. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm.